You're viewing a message from the pulpit of Rolling Hills Church, located in Verona, Pennsylvania. We're glad that you could join us as we open up the Word of God. Why does evil continue and why are there bad people in life? Before we get to our kids' time, wanted to uh, kind of focus in a little bit. Uh, we do this every week. We focus on one particular ministry at this time, and this week gives us an opportunity to talk about the youth ministry here, uh, because a number of you may not even realize that we have, oh, at right around 10 teenagers or so that uh, what we've been doing is we get together once a month uh, for some type of Bible study and activity at our house. Um, But once a month is not enough uh, for our students to really learn how to grow into the, uh, the men and the women that God is calling them to. It's not enough time for them to build those relationships with one another. So one of the things that we would like to be able to do is to begin offering a, uh, every other week. But in order to do that, uh, we would need a couple people, we would need your help with that. Uh, someone that would be willing to, to host a group, uh, to have the kids come over to their house. They're not that destructive, just a little. Um, but it's really, it's about just being a presence in their lives. Uh, willingness to, to share what God has done in your life, to teach Um, go through some kind of Bible study. We have plenty of curriculum and everything else that you would be able to utilize for that. While they certainly learn from the Bible study, again, the the main focus of this is really the thing that they get out of it is the opportunity to build a relationship with some of the adults in our church. So uh, if if it's something that maybe God has impressed upon your heart, please come speak with myself or my wife and uh, we, can, we can get you lined up and, and maybe give you a little bit more information on what it is that we are looking for and how you can serve in that way. Uh, they're, they're a lot of fun. One of the things that we want to begin doing are some trips and things like that, that in order to do so, again, it needs more than just the two of us. Uh, so please be in prayer for that. All right, so I will ask our children now to make their way forward. So we're not talking teenagers, now we're talking youngins. We're not talking youths. You guys aren't youths yet. So I have a question. See if you guys can figure out what this picture is behind me here. Uh, not, not the one that's showing now. There it is. What is that? It's not a shovel. We're asking the kids. I hope you guys know. I know, I know, I know. What is it? A hoe. It is a hoe. Now, here is the big question. How many of your parents have ever randomly, while you're driving in the car and a song comes on, have any of your parents all of a sudden just went into a ho, ho, ho? They don't do that while they're driving or anything? No, okay. Sometimes, some parents might, I don't know, maybe I have from time to time. But this type of hoe is used for what? Gardening. For gardening. And we're going to be talking about in our lesson, in, our, in the sermon today, we're going to talk from Matthew 13, where Jesus is giving this, uh, this what's called a parable or a story. And he's talking about how the church and the world is a lot like a field. And so if you have a field, let's say you're growing strawberries in your field. Do any of you guys get that Beatles reference? Anyone? No? Okay. Your parents do, hopefully. So you're growing strawberries in a field. And 
all of these weeds start to grow up amongst the strawberries. Now, if you use a hoe to clear out the weeds, what's going to happen? What do you think? If they're growing really close to the strawberries, what's going to happen? Yeah. This the You're going to end up taking the strawberries along with the weeds. And so that's why you want to be, you don't want to necessarily use a hoe. Now, they have some other stuff that you could use. They have weed killer. It's a spray that you can spray on all these different things. The only problem with the weed killer is a lot of times the spray does not know the difference between a weed and a strawberry. So what could happen? you'll end up killing the strawberries as well. So Jesus is talking about his church, but he's also talking about the world. And he says, you know, a lot of times people wonder why in a church or why in the world do we have bad people? Why doesn't God just get rid of all of the bad people? Because it would make life so much easier for us. But what ends up happening if these bad people are... that's me, I think. If these bad people are mixed in with the good people, you're going to end up taking some good people along with it. So God says, or Jesus says to his followers, when you see a field like this where you have strawberries and weeds together, what you need to do is wait. You don't go out there and take the weeds, get rid of the weeds, because if you do that, you're going to take the good things as well, because you do not know better. Instead, what he says is wait until the end. Wait until it's time to collect the harvest, and then you let me decide who are the weeds and who are the strawberries, the, the, the wheat, the, the good seed. So it's very important when we think about sometimes we go to a church or maybe we're at school or something and we think we, we have a friend or we know someone that is one way in school and is very different when they're in church. And we think to ourselves, why in the world is that person here? They're a bad person. They're a bad seed. And Jesus tells us when that happens, you leave them there. You wait. And at some point, hopefully, our prayer is that that person would, what? That weed would turn into a strawberry somehow. God could do it. We cannot do that. But God can make a weed turn into a strawberry. But in order to do that, we need to have patience. And we need to remember uh, of God's grace and depend on His grace. Now, what is your favorite thing to eat from a garden? Beans, really? Any particular kind of beans? The Just long green one. ones? Just one. Okay. Who else? I want to eat. Strawberries. Okay. <laughs> Strawberries, all right? Carrots. Carrots? Lettuce? Mm -hmm. Okay, my favorite thing to eat out of the garden is pizza. <laughs> but unfortunately, I haven't been able to find a plant that grows pizza. So hopefully someday that'll be the case. Don't exist. They don't, not yet. I hope you guys can grow up and be nice and smart and figure out a way to plant for us to plant pizza. That'll be really good. Oh, that wouldn't taste good. Oh, I think it would. Pizza's pizza. Pizza always tastes good. Go in the door. Yeah. Door. Pizza with door doesn't sound good. It doesn't. No, that was, that was pizza good. always sounds good to me. But we're going to pray, okay? We're going to pray for all of those people that are in our lives that maybe we think that we need to have more patience with to, to not try to remove them or anything like that. Okay, let's pray. God, we do thank you for your church. We thank you for allowing us to be a part of this world. And Lord, we, we pray for either ourselves or those in our lives that, um, that we wonder sometimes why, why are they a part of our life. They're, they're nasty to us. They're mean to us. Um, they distract us in ways from you. God, we pray that you would remind us, uh, as your example shows us in this parable, 
that we are to be patient and we are to allow you to do your job, that you are the one that determines who is the weed and who is the wheat. But God, we ask that through all of that, that we would always be committed to seeing your Holy Spirit grow in the lives of all of those around us. Lord, that even, we, we know each and every one of us here was a weed at one point. And it's only by your grace and your mercy that we can become something other than that. So we pray that we would be able to see that same grace and that same mercy on display in the lives of those that are, in, that are around us. We pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. And will you join with me in prayer once again? God, we do pray as we come before you here with your word before us, that you would use it to speak to us in mighty ways, that these would be your words and not my own or the words of others, but we would know that they are spoken to us directly from your heart and from your mouth. Jesus Christ, to you be all the glory and honor in everything that we do here, we pray. In your precious name, amen. So next week, everything changes here at Rolling Hills. Maybe not everything. But at this time next week, I'm going to look out and I'm going to see a people who have probably received one hour less of sleep. <laughs> Eyes are going to be heavy. Uh, those that I get to watch every week take a nap. There's a few. Uh, you can be comforted in the fact that there will be others that will be joining you next week as you take your nap. Uh, and while losing an hour of sleep is certainly something that is no fun, I, it's a, it's, I hate that day next week. I, I really do. I hate losing that hour of sleep. But knowing that, it's going to ha that we will have sunlight until 7 or 7.30 next week is a wonderful thought to me. Now, with the coming of spring, we have some new ways in which you can be a part of, of uh, the life of this church. And one thing that is going to be happening already is we are going to have another new members class here in about uh, sometime after Easter and before summertime begins. So if you have not joined the church, uh, now might be the time for you to do so. Uh, do you have to join a church to be a Christian? No, you do not have to. Is, it is not a requirement for heaven. It is not a requirement for your relationship with God. But there is something to saying to the people around you that you worship with, I am going to stand with you. I am going to be a part of this also. More than someone that's coming and attending, it's a way for us to step up our commitment in supporting the church, in praying for it, being a part of the church, and what else is everything that is happening here at Rolling Hills. Uh, I would ask you to pray about it. Uh, do not just assume that church membership is something that's really not for you, but instead really commit to praying through this issue and ask God where he may be leading you in regards to church membership. Now, there's going to be a lot more information about this as the, the date approaches, but I would encourage you, if you are interested, uh, just mark it on the attendance pad uh, or come and speak with me and let me know that it's something that uh, God has maybe laid upon your heart. Now, a couple of weeks ago, our dog Sadie had her one-year birthday. And in having a puppy and also in having children in the house, uh, it becomes important for us to train up our dog in certain ways, uh, that, that she would be obedient to different commands that we would teach her. And Sadie is far from being trained yet. If you've, come, if you've come over to our house, you know she's a typical retriever. She will jump on you. She will, she's excited that you're there. Um, but one thing that someone from here uh, that, that helped us to do with Sadie is she was able to help us uh, train Sadie to leave something on the ground instead of like if we drop a piece of food, she knows not to just run right over and try to scarf it down or anything. And that's an important thing to teach a dog. 
Uh, it helps them to not accidentally bite someone. Like if I were to drop a steak, which I would hope I would never do, but if I were to drop something and I go to reach for it, and she's reaching for it at the same time with her mouth, it prevents an accidental bite. Uh, it keeps her from eating something that could be potentially harmful to her. If it's, you know, really hot, uh, I do like to cook with spices, and it would be, she would very easily, you know, probably burn her mouth eating some of the things that I would eat. So, what we do with Sadie is when we are going to give her a treat, our, our kids and myself will uh, we'll do different tricks with her or obedience commands. But one of the ones that we do is we will take the treat, put it right in front of her face on the floor. She'll sit there and we'll say, leave it. And it is her job to not touch the food. So she'll be right at our feet. We'll put the food down. We'll say, leave it. And she'll look at the food and then look at us. And then look at the food and look back at us. And she'll just do this like a tennis match kind of thing. Um, going back and forth, looking between us and the food. Sometimes, because I'm, I'm one that really likes to test her in this, I'll put something down and I'll, I'll tell her to leave it there for like 30 seconds. And she'll start to do the drool thing. Uh, and she'll have this look of just like utter depression and, and sadness. Like, will you please just let me eat this treat? But this little obedience training, what it does is it helps Sadie to learn patience. And I think from time to time, maybe that's something that we need to do in our own lives. Each and every one of us needs a leave it command. That when God says to us, okay, I need you to leave it there, that we are obedient in that. Now, strange transition here, but the parables that we are about to read this morning uh, that come from Jesus' teaching in Matthew 13 it, it teaches us what God is telling us to do about things that can be very harmful in our lives, and God's message to us is once again, leave it. So if you have your Bibles, if you can turn to Matthew 13, starting in verse 24, and we're going to do a little bit of jumping around just in Matthew 13, but uh, starting in 24, we read this. He put another parable before them, saying... The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared also. And the servants of the master of the house came to him and said, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have weeds? And he said to them, an enemy has done this. So the servants said to him, then do you want us to go and gather them up? But he said, no, lest in gathering the weeds you root up the wheat along with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And at harvest time I will tell the reapers, gather the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned. But gather the wheat into my barn. And then we're going to jump ahead to verse 36 for the explanation of this parable. Then he left the crowds and went into the house, and his disciples came to him, saying, Explain to us the parable of the weeds of the field. He answered, The one who sows the good seed is the Son of Man. The field is the world, and the good seed is the sons of the kingdom. The weeds are the sons of the evil one, and the enemy who sowed them is the devil." The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are angels. Just as the weeds are gathered and burned with fire, so will it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all lawbreakers, and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father, he who has ears, let him hear. Now we also have this other parable in the same chapter that deals with what is in essence the same exact message. If you jump ahead to verse 47 and continue along with me. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and gathered fish of every kind. 
When it was full, men drew it ashore and sat down and sorted the good into containers, but threw away the bad. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now quickly, I wanted to point out a couple of things with this parable. If we jump back to verse 24 and 25, we see a couple of interesting things that I think are very applicable to us in our lives. Um, we see in 25 what had happened, that we know now that, the, that Jesus is the one that went around and sowed this seed. But while his men, while his helpers were sleeping is when this uh, enemy came along and sowed the weeds. And isn't that very indicative of how we can be as a church? And here we have Jesus trying to establish his kingdom, and then the people, the good seed, or his helpers, are the ones that have fallen asleep and have allowed bad things to begin to happen. But then I think this is where it becomes uh, much more maybe poignant to us. Verse 27, And the servants of the master of the house came to him and said, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? How many times when bad things happen in our lives, who might be the first person that we try to blame? God, why didn't you do this in my life? You know, they're, they're blaming the master, and, and, and the master of the field is saying, No, you don't understand. It wasn't me. You guys fell asleep. <laughs> you allowed something to come into this world, and now we are dealing with the repercussions of this. So, did you ever wonder why particular people even exist? And I know that sounds incredibly harsh, but when you really think about it, some people who act so wickedly, you know, someone that is just, it seems that every intention of theirs is evil. Do you ever wonder why God allows someone like that to continue to exist? Now, we could think of the big names, you know, the, the different terrorists or Hitler or that type of thing. Um, sure, we can look at those lives and say, God, why in the world did you even allow someone like that to come to power? But the person you're thinking of might be the one that sits in the cubicle next to you at work. And you wonder to yourself, this person is only exists, it seems, to be a pain to me. They're always causing turmoil. Why does this person continue to exist? And people have asked questions like these for a very long time. Why does God allow evil to exist? Um, why doesn't he just eradicate evil right now so that we never have to deal with it again? And some will try to use these questions as the way to, to maybe cast doubt on God because they would say, if God is so good and if God is so powerful and if he is so loving, then why doesn't he just do away with the things that could hurt us? Because as any loving parent knows, we are not going to put knives and guns and everything else into our baby's room. We're not going to have anything that they could reach and harm themselves with. So if we remove it as a loving parent, why does God not remove evil from this world? And both of these parables this morning deal with good and evil existing at the same time and why they are allowed to exist at the same time. These parables allow us to deal with a very difficult question and something that we are going to deal with more in a few weeks. Today, though, uh, what we want to deal with is just one part or one way to maybe answer this question, why does evil continue and why are there bad people in life? So in these parables, Jesus is technically talking about something other than the world, but we can certainly see how it can apply uh, to us, as a, whether it's to the, to the world or to the church as a whole. And we're, we will see how easy it is to take this parable and see how its application is found both in the church uh, with different people that we worship with and as well as in the world. Before we get to that, though, what I would like for us to, to understand, first of all, 
is how these verses serve as a reminder that we cannot assume that we know how things are going to go in the future. We as Christians have a, no idea what's going to happen tomorrow. Yet, many Christians, we arrogantly walk around and we proclaim that we know exactly what's going to happen at the end of time. We don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, but I can clearly tell you how God's going to end the world. And we know that at some point, the end is going to come. Because all of us are destined for eternity. We are all made for eternity. And in eternity, time does not matter. And I've spoken about the end times before, way back when I first started here and we were preaching through 1 Thessalonians. And I shared about this idea of the rapture. And I'm not talking about the Blondie song, which is a great song, but I'm talking about something else concerning the rapture. The rapture, it's this teaching that Jesus is going to come again in the clouds, and he is go going to call his church home, and we will meet him in the clouds. And depending on where we fall on the belief spectrum, people will say, okay, this is either going to happen right before the beginning of the really bad stuff, so it'll happen and then the, the world will suffer for another seven years. Other people will say, no, God's going to come three and a half years into it. He wants his church to experience some of it, but not the really, really, really bad stuff. Or they say, no, the church is going to experience the whole thing, but we still have a promise of a homecoming. And so when I preached about it last, I had shared, if God wanted to bring us all home, could he do so? Of course he could. He could do whatever he wants to. He is God. I am not going to say that God is not going to do something. He can do whatever he wants to. But I do interpret some of these different verses that people point to saying, this is the rapture. I interpret those a little bit differently. And so I do not believe in the typical rapture. And let me say, this is one of these points that is not that vital. You know, it, it's not something that because you believe it this way and you believe it that way, that we should call into question one another's faith, that we should call into question someone's intellect or their relationship with God. They're not, they're, they're fun to talk about and they are wonderful to hope in, but they're not vital in the sense of salvation. But one of the reasons I do not believe in the rapture in the typical teaching is because of verses like Matthew 13, 30. And because if you read it again, we see that Jesus says, at harvest time, I will tell the reapers, gather the weeds first. That's kind of not what we're taught when we think about the rapture. We are taught that God is going to, to call the church out first, but people, if they were to take these verses out of context, which I am clearly doing here, they could take it out of context to say, okay, this means that God is going to take the nasty people and leave all the good people. The thing is, I do not want this to be a parable about the end times or anything like that, even though it is clearly about final judgment. But it is to offer as a reminder to us that whenever somebody has said, this is how God is going to do something, very many times God humbles us in, our, in that thinking. He might be able to give us a little bit of a guideline or something along those lines, but most of the time he doesn't. He didn't say to Abraham, this is what I'm bringing you to. He said to Abraham, leave. That was it. And that's all he had to do. Faith, have faith in God one step at a time. So, on to the parable. We have all seen some pretty evil things in our lives, haven't we? And I hope it hasn't been firsthand. But if we ever watch the news or we read stories on the internet, we know that there are some truly awful things that happen out there. And we are coming into a section of Matthew 13 where Jesus is explaining what the kingdom of God is like. And if you remember, he did this in the Sermon on the Mount way back in Matthew 5. Time and time again, he points out that if we want to be a part of this kingdom, this is how we are supposed to live. If you want to know what it means to be a Christian, turn to Matthew 5, 6, and 7, and that will tell you. But now he is telling us why the kingdom is the way it is. And it seems odd to us because 
Jesus is saying that the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God is close by. It is at hand. It is, it is here and now, yet evil still flourishes. Evil still thrives. And though whether or not this parable is about the kingdom of God or about the world or the church or all three, I mean, it can be debated, but they certainly have application in all three parts. One thing that we do see here is that even though the kingdom of God is a present reality, that Jesus came and he said, okay, here's the kingdom now, but there is a kingdom coming. Even though these two things exist at the same time, evil is still going to exist as well. And parts of this parable sound very familiar to us from last week's parable about the four different types of soil. Uh, there are a couple of differences. In this one, Jesus is the one that is casting out the good seed. Uh, the field is the world, and the good seed are those who follow Jesus Christ. Not those who claim to be a Christian, but those who are living by kingdom principles, sons and daughters of the kingdom, whose lives have been changed by the gospel. And then the weeds are those who live in accordance to the ways of Satan, and he is the one that is responsible for bringing these people into the story. And understand one thing here, that when, we, when Jesus talks about a son of Satan, one of these weeds, he's not saying that you are only a son of Satan or a child of the devil if you go around and do these horribly atrocious things, if you murder innocent things or, or pillage or rob or anything like that. A son or daughter of Satan does exactly what Satan, their father, does, and that is rebel against God. It's very easy to be an offspring of the enemy. All we have to do is be ourselves. And we have to understand that. It is very easy for us to be an enemy of God. All we have to do is be ourselves. And this is why God changes who we are. So it is into this field or into the world that Jesus Christ has established his church. And since the church is in the world, uh, even the church itself is going to have some weeds in it. And these are very dangerous weeds because they look a lot like the wheat. They have the same appearance on the outside, but inside they are very different from one another. Um, maybe what has happened with these weeds is that they have not experienced this life-changing, life-altering relationship with Jesus Christ. They haven't experienced his forgiveness. They haven't seen his power in their own lives. And so they continue existing with the wheat, even though they are very, very different from it. And this is why some churches and why some denominations take something like sound biblical doctrine and they make it such a big deal because we recognize that there are some people in the church that even though they look like us, and even though they come from the same kind of background that we do, instead of making their lives line up to Scripture, they come into the church and they try to make church look like the society around us. And we cannot do that as a church. The church is supposed to change the society around us. So what this enemy of, uh, of the farmer comes into the field and he sows this, uh, this weed. And most likely this weed is something that is called a bearded, I don't know if it's darnel or darnel, I don't, I don't know plants or anything like that, a bearded darn, it's something with a beard, so we'll call it hipster weeds, okay? Which can be a very dangerous thing. But it's very close in appearance to wheat when it is young. Uh, what, what happens is the, the roots of, this, the, of the two plants, the hipster weeds and the wheat, they begin to grow together and they become entangled with one another. So to pull one out means you would have to pull both out. And after the heads, it's only until the heads of the grain begin to appear that it is then much easier to figure out which is the weed and which is the uh, wheat. And by that time, it's already time for the harvest to begin. 
See, there are lots of people who claim to be a Christian because, you know, I have this great t-shirt and it says John 3.16 emblazoned across it. Or, I'm a Christian. I listen to Caleb. I watch these Christian movies. I come to worship every single Sunday. I give regularly. Um, you might even eat Christian mints. If you knew there was such a thing, you could go to the Christian bookstore and buy Christian mints. And you can do all of those things. You could be a worship leader. You could be a deacon. You could be a pastor. And you could look like you are a Christian. You are doing all of the right things. But just because you look a certain way, that does not mean that that makes someone a child of Christ. There needs to be a relationship between us and our Savior. Jesus Christ needs to be Lord over our lives. And we need to be in this type of relationship where we see clearly that he is becoming greater and I am becoming less. So be careful in who you listen to. Just because somebody's face is on the Christian TV channel does not necessarily mean that they are speaking God's word. Just because you read something that you bought in a Christian bookstore does not mean that they are really preaching and writing the gospel. There are a lot of weeds in the church, and some of these weeds look really good. They're really polished. They're, they, they communicate exceptionally well, but they were implanted there to entangle us, to choke us out, to confuse us, or to confuse those who really do seek to have a relationship with God. What happens is they see these people on TV or they read these books, they read these stories of these people that are claiming to be Christians. Some might even be running for president, but I don't want to go too far with that. <laughs> they see what these many people are doing. They, they claim to be a Christian, and then they see the way they act, and they think, I want nothing to do with Christ if that is the example of a Christian. So in reading this parable, the enemy does a very good job of spreading these weeds throughout the entire field. Uh, it's not just like the enemy found this one particular section of the field and just threw all the weeds down in there. He walks through the entire field um, spreading this weed so that it can have an impact on the good seed. And this is something else that is very important for us to remember as a church. It's very easy for people in every single denomination, in every non-denominational church, to point the finger and say, boy, I'm glad we're not there. Those people have messed this thing up so much, or they, they're doing it wrong. Uh, I'm glad that we're not there. We need to remember as the church that the weeds are in every single part of the field. Even in our own denomination, even in our own church. Sometimes a person may not know that he or she is a weed. They might look around and they think, well, I'm kind of doing the same thing that everybody else is doing, it seems, so I think I'm okay. Again, remember, this infancy stage of this weed, it looks a lot like the wheat, and it only takes time and maturity to, to show which is true and which is not. But other times, a weed is only there to cause trouble for the wheat. And when this happens in a church, it needs to be addressed and we need to take care of it. And it needs to be taken care of with a clear indication to the person that the church is not going to stand for these kinds of actions, these kinds of words, or this kind of teaching. Now we do that with grace and we do that with as much humility as God can give us. Now, Greg, that sounds kind of harsh, though, because even Jesus said to wait. And he did, and I give you that, but delayed judgment still means that judgment will happen. Jesus in these parables is not saying, hey, thanks be to me, there's no more judgment anymore. No, it's going to happen, but Jesus says, wait for it, leave it. It is the role of the church to help people realize what they are doing 
to help them find the thing that their souls are looking for, that they are searching for, and help them give their lives over to the Lordship of Jesus Christ so that they can turn from a weed and into the wheat. You see, judgment is inevitable. And my prayer is that we would all be able to be on God's side when this verdict comes. Because we are talking about eternity here. We cannot take this lightly. One of the greatest quotes from C.S. Lewis, he said one day he was walking down the street and, it, and it, he finally realized that each and every person he meets is either going to become one of the most glorious things in eternity or one of the most despicable creatures in eternity. And we have this lifetime to figure that out. The end is coming, so may our harvest be pleasing to the Lord of the harvest. So as we walk through this field known as our world and we find evil all throughout it, um, at the same time we walk in this field and we see the evidence of God's grace and his mercy in dis on display in many different unexpected ways. And through it all, both are allowed to exist. The wheat and the weeds are allowed to exist at the same time in the world and in the church. So why does evil, why does the seed of the evil one continue to exist? Why didn't God just eradicate it? Because God is patient. And thank God for his patience. Because as I said with our children, each and every one of us was a weed at one point each and every one of us. So when we look at the world and we say, oh, but that person is so evil and that person is so wicked, God looked at us at one point in the same way. But thankfully, in his patience, he allowed us to stay here. He said, leave it to somebody else. When we first started coming to church, whether it was with our parents or as a Christian, that, that somebody that just became a Christian, and we were saying some pretty dumb things at the time, or we were acting in some really bad ways, God said to somebody at that time, leave it. Let this person grow. Give them a chance. This parable and the one about the net is all about God's patience in our lives and a reminder it's about patience, but it's also a, re a reminder that patience does run out at some point and that judgment will arrive. And I know that does not necessarily answer why do all these bad things happen in life or why does evil still exist. It's only a partial answer to that question, but there will be more that we can look to to address it uh, in the weeks after Easter. But for now, may we be able to rejoice and be found in God's mighty mercy that he so patiently waited for us to receive. And if you have not received it yet, maybe now is that time because we do not know what tomorrow has. And God is always far beyond our thinking and he is far beyond our plans. And we might be saying to ourselves, you know, I just need a little more time, God, but sometimes that patience runs out and we need to come to God as quickly as possible. Will you please pray with me? God, we thank you for your great mercy that you have displayed to us time and time again. And even beyond your, your mercy and your patience and your grace, God, we thank you for the life-changing power that you displayed in our lives. And God, we know that as we stand before you now, if, if we have been changed from a weed into, a, into wheat, we know that we're st we still haven't arrived. We are still growing. God, we're certainly not perfect by any stretch of the imagination, but we thank you that we are changed. And we thank you that that is a change that can only be brought about by you, Jesus Christ. So God, as we think about who we were and where we have come from, we thank you for the patience that you have shown us and that you allowed other people to show us as we were coming of age in the church and in this field. 
And Lord, we pray that we would be able to extend that same kind of patience to those around us. And more than the patience, that we would be able to be a tool in which you use to change a person's life from a weed into the wheat. God, make us useful for more than just strangling things and, and uh, being um, a hazard to others that are growing around side of us. God, instead, may we be the kind of people, may we be the um, followers of you that people would be able to look to to say, I know they don't have it all together and I know they're not right on everything, but they have a grace about them They have a mercy that goes uh, beyond anything that I've seen, and they have a peace that surpasses all understanding. And God, may people see that kind of work in our lives, and may they desire it in theirs as well. God, we pray that as the uh, the people uh, in this parable... um, that we would be able to not fall asleep and that we would notice evil as it is growing around us and that we would be diligent in knowing where it is and how to keep it at bay. God, help us to be a church that remains committed to your teachings and not to the whims and the ways of this world. Lord, may we stand firm in your word to us in, in, in Scripture and hold tight to it, knowing that it is your teaching, that these, those are your ways, and that we would not be governed by the way of this world. And Lord, we also pray that we would not test your patience. God, that we would understand that delayed judgment is still judgment at some point. And God, help us to be a people that are forgiven by you. And I pray for anyone that is in this room right now that has not experienced your forgiveness in their lives. They've been searching. They've they've felt for a long time now that they need something more in their lives. God, I pray that they would find that in you. That they would be willing to surrender their lives over to your lordship. And if you are that person, I ask that you would pray along with me. Many times when we come before God, whether we've been a Christian for a minute or for 50 years, many times we do not know what to say to God. And we have to speak our hearts. So if you are, if you've been searching and you're tired of searching, then please pray this prayer with me. God, I thank you for your work in my life. I thank you for bringing me to a moment in which I can turn to you and surrender my life to you. God, I know that you died on the cross in order to forgive me of my sins. And I accept that forgiveness in my life right now. And though I do not know what all it it means or, or what's going to happen, I know that my soul has been uneasy for the longest time. And I want to find peace in you. So Jesus Christ, come and bring me your peace. Shower me with your forgiveness and begin pulling me into that right relationship with the Father. And if you have prayed that prayer, I I ask that you would please come up and, and talk with me afterwards that I can agree with you in that prayer and encourage you. Don't just walk out of here after praying something like that and and assume that, okay, now I'm good, but instead come and talk with me, please, that we can continue to pray. And God, we ask now that as we wrap this time up, that we would remember 
your words to us, that we would go forth from here knowing that we are a forgiven people, but also knowing that um, you are a patient God. And may we be able to show that same kind of patience to others in our lives. It's in your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. Visit us on the web at www.rollinghillschurch.today or drop in for a visit at 120 Garner Drive, Verona, PA, 15147. Service time is 10 a.m. on Sunday. Send us a message via email to rollinghillsbaptist at comcast.net or reach us by phone at 412-795-1133.